1 Samuel chapter 31. We're wrapping up the book of 1 Samuel tonight, and there's several, several lessons we can learn here. First of all, I want to point out there in uh, verses 1 and 2, it says, Now the Philistines fought against Israel, and the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines, and fell down slain in Mount Gilboa. And the Philistines followed hard upon Saul and upon his sons. And the Philistines slew Jonathan and Abinadab and Melchishua, Saul's sons. And if we remember the character of Jonathan, this is kind of a, a tragedy. In fact, it is a tragedy because of that, that even Jonathan here had to go down uh, with dad, unfortunately. Because Jonathan, if you remember in the story, was very loyal to David. You know, he was one that was, uh, he had given him his shield and his buckler and his robe and had accepted the fact that he was not going to be the heir to the throne, but that David was going to take his position. And of course, we know, remember in the story, he went and told him several times about his dad, had warned him about him and so on and so forth. So it really is a, a tragedy here that Jonathan has to die as well. And, you know, there's a whole other, we could talk about how, uh, you know, being with the wrong people at the, in the wrong place at the wrong time, you know, that, that's not, uh, the, you know, there could be consequences because of that. But really what I want to focus in on here is the fact that, you know, this is all a result of Saul's sin. You know, remember this whole, everything that plays out in this chapter is because of the fact that Saul got out of sorts with the Lord, was backslidden, and stayed that way. And we'll talk here at the end about, even that in itself is a tragedy because of how well he started out in, in, his, uh, in his reign. But what we see here through the, the death of Jonathan is the fact that, you know, the, the negative consequences of sin can have far-reaching effects beyond what we could ever anticipate. Uh, when Saul started out and, and it, you know, went ahead and, and, and got out of sorts with the Lord, if you remember what it was, he was supposed to kill all the, uh, the, the Amorites, he was supposed to kill King Agag. And he kept the best of the sheep and the oxen and saved the king alive. And we remember when Saul, Samuel came to him and rebuked him and said, you know, uh, you know, rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. It is better to, you know, better to, uh, obedience. It is better to obey than to have offerings and sacrifices and so on and so forth. That's what got Saul in trouble is the fact that he did not obey the voice of the Lord. He did not keep the commandment of God. That was his sin. And, of course, you know, you read that story when that took place. And you think, well, it seems kind of harmless. Is it really that bad? And, I mean, he just saved some sheep alive. He kept the king alive as a kind of trophy. But what the, the problem was is that he was not being obedient to the word of God. And that's a sin. And we don't ever want to get to the place where we can start to rationalize away the commandments of the Lord. And when we do that, we're getting into sin. And though that sin can have far-reaching consequences. You know, sometimes people let sin into their life. And they think, oh, you know, it's not a big deal. It's not that big of a sin. And you know what? Maybe it isn't that big of a sin. Of course, some sins are worse than others. And the Bible teaches that. And people let, you know, some little sin in their life or they, they mess up in one area or whatever. And they, but they don't understand how far-reaching the consequences can be sometimes. They think, oh, I'm just going to sin. And, and, and the consequences are only going to affect me. You know, I'm just going to let a little sin in my life and I'm going to be the only one that's affected by it. You know, that's not the case. And this is the case, and this is an example of it here with Jonathan. I don't believe God is punishing Jonathan because of his sin. Or just because he was in the wrong place at the wrong time, he goes down, you know, with his dad. I think what the, the problem is that this is a form of punishment upon Saul, that even he and his sons would be punished, that they would die. That this is that the, his sons dying is a part of that punishment. And now when Saul started out, you know, when he said, hey, I'm going to keep King Agag alive, I'm sure that he wasn't thinking in the back of his head, this might get my sons killed. You know, he didn't sit there and, for, and, and think about the fact that maybe one day God was going to judge him so severely that three of his, his, his three sons are just going to be wiped out. But that's the way sin works in our life. You know, we think, oh, it's just this little thing. It's just this one little area. And the next thing you know, it has these just, you know, these compounding effect in our life. Just one sin leads to another. And that's the way it was in Saul's life. When we look back over his life, you know, it was one sin, and then he was told, hey, the kingdom's being taken from you. He dug in his heels, and then he's chasing David. He's, you know, he's, he's harassing him, the Lord's anointed, and so on and so forth. You remember the story. This is, this is a punishment, I believe, because you don't have to go there. Go to Galatians 6. But we read a few weeks ago in 1 Samuel 28, when he goes to the witch at Endor, calls up Samuel. Samuel comes to him. And, you know, he says, hey, you know, why, why, you know, why disturbest thou me? You know, why are you calling me up? 
And then he pronounces the judgment. You know, what's going to happen? He says, because thou obeyedest not the voice of the Lord, referring back to King Agag, nor executed his fierce wrath upon Amalek, therefore hath the Lord done this thing unto thee this day. And this is just an inescapable law that nobody is exempt from. It's inescapable that if we reap to the flesh, we shall of the flesh, excuse me, if we sow to the flesh, we shall of the flesh reap corruption. That we can't just do whatever we want and not experience consequences. And those consequences sometimes are beyond what we would, what we would deem appropriate. We'd say, oh, I'm going to sin, and I'm going to get judged for it, and that's appropriate, that's okay. God could, you know, God could go even further than that than we might anticipate. The Bible says in James, James 1, Every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth what? Death. Severe consequences. Now, I'm not, it's not saying, you know, if you sin, you're going to die. But, you know, if there's going to be severe consequences. And in some ways, you know, it, it, metaphorically speaking, there is death when we sin. You know, if we sin, our joy has died. You know, the chance to have some victory has died. The chance to do right is dead. Okay? And often, you know, and as in the case of, of Saul, when we sin and we do it long enough and it's bad enough, there is death. <laughs> I mean, literally. That's what happens to him. And even that death goes upon other people. That punishment can extend to others around us. We can bring harm to those that are nearest to us through our own sin. And this is something we all have to understand. We see it in Saul's life, and it's something that's reiterated throughout the Scripture. You're there in Galatians chapter 6, look at verse 7. It says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. And we want to deceive people, right? People, people want to deceive themselves, thinking, no, that's not the way it is. The devil wants to deceive us and say, you know, you know, you shall not surely die. You shall be as gods. It's not a bad thing. The world wants to deceive us and say it's not that bad. It's no big deal. Whatever sin it is, just go ahead and do it. But, you know, God is not mocked, the Bible says. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. That is just an immutable law that is in the word of God. It's just a fact. It's like gravity. It's inescapable. It's just something that works either for us but it, or against us. I mean, that could, either, you, that could be a curse or a promise. That whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. You know, if we sow to the flesh, we shall of the flesh reap corruption, it says. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of, of the Spirit reap life everlasting. <clears throat> so what's the result? So knowing that, knowing and understanding that, you know, whatsoever we sow, we're going to reap, he explains in verse 9, and let us not be weary in well-doing. You know, we think about that verse and say, well, you reap what you sow. We always think about that it seems like, in negative terms. We think about, oh, yeah, if I, you know, I'm not going to do this, or if people do bad things, bad things are going to come back upon them. There's going to be consequences for sin, and that's true. You know, but what we should try to think about is the fact that that can work for us, that if we sow to the Spirit, we shall of the Spirit uh, reap life everlasting. And because of that, let's not be weary and well-doing. You know, we should always try to seek to do well, do what's right, do what's righteous do the right thing and if we do that that law works for us we're then going to reap life and not death so you can either make that work for you or against you and unfortunately for saul he sowed to the flesh and he of the flesh reaped corruption and he reaped so much that it even affected people like jonathan who was a good man if you look there go over to mark chapter 3 i'll read to you from first uh, samuel 31 it says in the battle went sore against saul and the archers hit him, and he was sore wounded of the archers. Then said Saul unto his armor-bearer, you're going to Mark 3, Draw thy sword and thrust me through therewith, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and abuse me. But his armor would not, for he was sore afraid. Therefore Saul took a sword and fell upon it. Now that's not like running with scissors. You know, this means he, he took a sword and, and set it up and just... You know, what was that? What's that thing the, uh, the Japanese would do in World War II? It's like the, the, the ones that practice Bushido. Anyone know what I'm talking about? It, it's not here. I'm trying to, I, I want to say it. I know it's wrong. And they would literally, they, rather than be captured by the enemy, they would, they would thrust themselves through with a sword. And that's what, you know, that's what they, uh, Saul's doing here. Not, now, of course, he's not doing it because he's practicing Bushido. You know, he's saying, look, I'm going to do this because I don't want these Philistines, the enemy, to come upon me and abuse me. You know, he doesn't want to be desecrated by them. He doesn't want to be tortured to death or whatever. 
So he fell upon his sword, and when his armor bearer saw, saw that Saul was dead, he fell likewise upon his sword and died with him. So he doesn't really talk a lot about the armor bearer, but it's, it's kind of interesting. It says that he would not, for he was sore afraid. So he kind of seemed to understand that what David understood. You don't touch the Lord's anointed. Even if he gives you a sword and says, run me through, you know, put me out of my misery. Nope, I'm not going to do it. And he was so committed to Saul for whatever reason. You know, that's my guess is why he went ahead and died with him. Or maybe he just saw, you know, he was cornered. He was surrounded. He, his, you know, he was facing the same fate what Saul was going to. Or maybe he thought, hey, you know, the Philistines are going to come up on us. And they're going to find Saul dead. And if I'm still alive, then they're just going to do to me what they wanted to do to him. And so he decided to take his own life. So here two people are committing suicide. So Saul died and his three sons and his armor bearer and all his men that same day together. And isn't that how it often works when we get into sin? You know, we were just going along, thinking we're getting away with it, getting with it, and just one day, it just all comes down on us. I mean, Saul, I mean, he kind of did know it was ha com coming because Samuel told him. But, I mean, when he received that news, no one gets into sin thinking, I know one day this is all just going to come back upon my head. There's just going to be severe consequences. Nobody thinks that when they first start to get into sin. That's how it works. What I want to talk about tonight is this topic, just briefly, is the topic of suicide. You know, most people in the room probably already understand this. But, you know, this might just be a good, some good uh, note-taking in your Bible to mark your Bible for when you go soul winning. Because, you know, I always try to make a point of bringing up suicide with people. Not, not to go on and on about it, but it's kind of a, like a thing I use in my soul winning to just kind of test if people are getting it. You know, if I've gone through the gospel and I've kind of explained, you know, eternal life, eternal security, that's a gift. Then one of the things I'll do is I'll say, you know, you kind of use myself as an example. If, you know, if I got into sin... You know, what, you know, what I, and I did this, that, and the other thing, you know, would I still go to heaven? And then they'll say, yeah, yeah, you'll still go to heaven because it's all by belief. And I'll say, yeah, I still would go to heaven, you know, but there'd be consequences, right? And I'll say, yeah. And I'll say, you know, God would chase me. I might lose my job. You know, my wife might leave me if I commit adultery or something like that. Or, you know, I could get so uh, depressed about it, I start taking drugs and alcohol, I lose my job. And then I say, you know what, I could just get so down in the dumps about my life that I even commit suicide. I take my own life. And then I ask him again, would I still go to heaven? And you'd be surprised how many people would say, oh, yeah, if you did this or you did that, you'd still go to heaven. But as soon as you bring up suicide, it's like, well, they don't know how to answer. Or they just say no. So I always throw that out there because that really drives that point home. Now, you don't have to do that. But I find that it's, it's useful. So maybe marking these scriptures would be profitable to you in your soul wedding. And they say that a lot of people get confused and they say, well, you know, I thought that was the unpardonable sin. I've heard them say that. Well, you know, that, he can't, that can't be forgiven. That's the unpardonable sin. So you got to, you know, and there's a couple ways to go at it. And really, I just, I often will refer back to Samuel. I'll say, well, you remember, most people don't know who Samuel was, or Saul was. They wanna, I'll say, you know, the first king of Israel, and he was told that he would be with, with, with the prophet Saul in heaven the next day, and the next day he committed suicide. And they'll go, oh, yeah. And then you could bring up another example of, like, Samson, right? But here's the thing. If this is the unpardonable sin, well, then, you, you know, just kind of thinking this through is that, well, then was Saul, or was, well, excuse me, was Samuel lying? Or was he wrong when he told Saul that tomorrow thou shalt thou and thy sons be with me? Because that's what he told me. He said, hey, I know what's going to happen tomorrow. The Lord is your enemy, and tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. And then Saul goes to commit suicide. So that either means that you could commit suicide and still go to heaven, or one of three things. Samuel was either lying, he was just mistaken, or Samuel was in hell, right? <laughs> Because that's where he was. You know, he, he has, he's going to be where he is. But we know that he wasn't, it wasn't any of those things. That because salvation is by grace through faith, it's not of works. You know, me going to heaven is not because I don't do or don't commit certain sins. <laughs> no, so, and, and the other thing is, you know, you can mark Mark 3 if you're there, Mark 3, 22. You know, the Bible explicitly tells us what that unpardonable sin is. Jesus, you know, lays it out for us. And where, where people get tripped up and confused by this is because of Catholicism. You know, a lot of times you'll run into confusion this when you're, when you're in a neighborhood where people, there's a Catholic influence. You know, when you start to see the, the shrines out in the front yard, the pictures on the door, so on and so forth. It says in Mark 3, verse 22, And the scribes which came down from Jerusalem said, He hath Beelzebub. You know, Beelzebub is a, the devil, a demon, right, a spirit, an evil spirit. This is them talking about Jesus. 
He hath Beelzebub, and by the prince of the devils uh, casteth he out devils. So Jesus is healing all these people, doing all these miracles, casting out demons and devils. And the, and the Pharisees see this, and they say, oh, he's doing that by the power of the devils. You know, and that kind of gives us a little bit of an insight, too. I mean, they're wrong, obviously, but it also shows us that maybe they were on to something. You know, that sometimes the devil allows things to happen to try and, you know, lend credence to, like, a false religion, right? Like, sometimes you'll hear, you know, speaking of Roman Catholicism, they'll say crazy things like, you know, there's this, this idol, oh, excuse me, statue, is what they call it, right? But we know it's an idol. You know, there's this idol of Mary that, that tears of blood came out of it. You know, it cried blood one day. Everyone hears stories like that, right? And you know what? Some of those things might actually have happened. Or someone miraculously heals another person. Or, you know, some priest goes and exercises a demon out of somebody. Well, those things might actually be taking place. But does that necessarily mean it's of God? Or maybe it's because, you know, although the Pharisees are wrong about Jesus, maybe they're kind of on to something that sometimes the devil lets things happen to try and lend credence to somebody. Maybe the devil kind of let that happen so people could say, well, maybe those Pentecostal faith healers are, are where it's at. You know, maybe if, 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 if uh, you know, I, if I let somebody rub oil in my head and I bark like a dog roll on the floor, whatever, you know, if I, if I get hooked up with them, then maybe those kinds of things will happen for me because this looks so real. It's convincing, right? The devil will do things like that to convince people to get involved in false religion and, and believe a false gospel and remain unsafe. And sometimes people get so deep into that stuff, you just cannot convince them of anything else. Because they'll say, yeah, but, you know, I had, their experience will override the scripture. You know, they'll say things like, yeah, I know what the Bible says, but I know what I feel, I know what I saw. You know, and, and what they don't realize is that, well, that might have just been the devil trying to work on you and keep you in bondage. So they say, he hath uh, Beelzebub, and by the prince of the devils cast he out devils. And he called them unto him and said unto them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? And if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan rise up against himself and be divided, he cannot stand, but hath an end. No man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, then he will spoil his house. Verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men. Now how many sins are going to be forgiven unto the sons of men? All of them. That would include suicide, right? Or Jesus is a liar. We know he's not. All sins shall be forgiven unto men, and blasphemies wherewith they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness. So what is the unpardonable sin? Is it suicide? No, all sins shall be forgiven. The, 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 the unpardonable sin is when you blaspheme the Holy Ghost. And Jesus isn't just going off in a tangent. He isn't just, this isn't unrelated what just what we just read previously. He's, he's responding to their accusation that he does this by the power of the devil. He does this through devils, by the prince of devils, casting thee out devils. He's responding to their accusation by saying, he that blasphemous against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, because Jesus is doing these things through the power of the Holy Ghost that was upon him. And they're attributing the works of God unto Satan. And that is the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. And even that's a good definition for that specific sin, the, what it means to blaspheme the Holy Ghost. Look, I get contacted all the time. You run into people that say, oh, you know, I think I blaspheme the Holy Ghost. I think I'm a reprobate. I'll never be saved because I, you know, I was thinking bad things. I was saying curse words to the Holy Ghost. And they think that's blaspheming the type of... Now, that is blasphemy. You shouldn't be doing that. But that's not what Jesus specifically is referring to when he says the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. The blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is when you attribute the works of God unto Satan. I don't know that very many people have done that. I, think, I don't think people that email our church or people we run into soul winning, the, the, the idea that they have of what it means to blaspheme this Holy Ghost lines up with what Jesus is explaining here. Does that make sense? They think it's, oh, you know, there used to be this thing on YouTube where there was like the blasphemy challenge or something like that. Remember that years ago? Where people would go on YouTube and just say, blankety blank, the Holy Ghost. I don't think, you should, I don't think it's a good idea. I don't recommend that. But Jesus did say, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto sons of men. Except, you know, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, which is in this specific instance, when you're saying, oh, that was something God did, that must be because the devil did it. <clears throat> so that is the, unpar the unpardonable sin. 
They have neither forgiveness, because it says in verse 30, because they said he hath an unclean spirit. So that's not, you know, suicide is not the unpardonable sin. It's the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost, and even within that context, it's very specific. You know, like I mentioned earlier, another, go over to Hebrews chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11. When you get on this topic of suicide with people, which is really a whole sermon in and of itself, you know, these are some good references to have. You know, you'll, you'll, you'll cite Saul and say, well, Saul, you know, fell on his own sword. And it wasn't because he, it was an accident. He did it on purpose, you know. <clears throat> you can cite, you know, Samson. More people will probably know more about Samson. You say, you remember Samson? You know, you're talking to somebody at the door. You remember Samson? They'll go, no. You know, the, the strong guy, even though the Bible doesn't say he was some buff dude. In fact, I don't think he was. He's probably just an average-looking guy. Because then the people would attribute his strength to his own physical strength. But <clears throat> they'll say, oh, yeah, yeah, Samson. You know, he did this, he did that. You say, well, you remember how he died? No. Well, he committed suicide, remember? Oh, yeah. You know, he pushed the pillars apart. I mean, that's how Samson died. He said, and he asked God for that strength to do that, specifically. He said, God, answer my prayer. Give me the strength just this one more time to avenge myself upon the Philistines. I'm paraphrasing, but that's what he asked, is that God would give him the strength to push those pillars apart and bring the whole house down upon and bring the cave, the roof in. I mean, talk about a guy who brought down the house, right? Yucca, yucca, yucca. But that's what he did. And he killed more Philistines in his death than in his whole life. But how did he do it? By committing suicide. Well, he must have gone straight to hell. And that's the unpardonable sin, right? No, he's actually in the hall of faith of Hebrews chapter 11. Verse 32, it says, And what shall I say more? The time would fail to tell me of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah and of David also and Samuel and of the prophets. And it goes on, whose face of the kingdom, so on and so forth. You know, he's bringing him up because he's, he's somebody who did great things for God and is in heaven. Because Hebrews 12 rolls willing into seeing, you know, seeing, uh, uh, wherefore seeing we are encompassed about by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay away every, every sin, every weight, the sin which does so easily beset us. So Hebrews 11, he's telling us who this cloud of witnesses are. And one of them is Samson, a guy who committed suicide, right? So <clears throat> these are just good examples when you're out soul winning. You know, I don't think anybody in this room is probably struggling with this tonight, but at least you have some reference points to, to point people to because it does come up, and I think it's worth bringing up at the door. You know, it, to at least kind of bring people home, really drive that point home, that faith, you know, that, that you can, uh, that salvation is by grace through faith, that's a gift. Because, again, you know, we don't go to heaven because we, don't com we do or don't commit certain sins. We go to heaven because of the fact that Jesus died for all of our sins as it says in Colossians, that he has nailed it to the cross, that he has taken it out of the way. He has forgiven us all trespasses. <clears throat> and again, this is kind of a, you know, something that Catholics seem to struggle with more than anybody because of the fact, you know, Catholicism teaches that suicide is what they call a mortal sin. Now, I'm just kind of getting into my studies on, you know, the specifics about Catholicism. <clears throat> but as I understand it, they have different types of sins. And one of them is mortal sins. I don't know, I can't recall what the other ones are. But they say that suicide is a mortal sin, which is, you know, mortal sin, I get, from my understanding, you know, and maybe there's an ex-Catholic in the room, they can confirm this, is that that's one of the more graver sins. Is that right? If you do a mortal one, that's like, there's the other ones that aren't as bad, but mortal, when you get into the mortal sins, you know, you have to repent of that or it's straight to hell. Right, that, that's it. You have to repent of that sin. And here's the thing about suicide. It falls into the category of mortal sins. And that's not something you can repent of. That's where they derive this teaching. You can't, you know, commit suicide and then, then say you're sorry because you're dead. Right? I mean, that's, that's kind of the logic behind it. <clears throat> and look, I'm not, it's not like we're pro-suicide up here or anything like that. You know, we're not promoting or we're not making light of it. But, you know, what we are saying is that you know, there's a false teaching out there concerning it. And the truth is that if you're saved, yeah, you could commit suicide and still go to heaven. Now, does that mean you should go do it? No, obviously not. You know, that's a very selfish thing to do. But let's move on in our story. If you want to go over to Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to head there next, but I'll read to you. Go to Ephesians 5. Um, I'll read to you from 1 Samuel 31. It says, going on in the story, And when the men of Israel that were on the other side of the valley and they that were on the other side of Jordan saw that the men of Israel fled, and that Saul and his sons were dead, they forsook the cities and fled. 
and the Philistines came and dwelt in them. So this is when they're, you know, this is a really bad day for Israel. They're just being completely overrun by the Philistines. And, you know, God's pointing out here that, the, that these men were on the other side of Jordan, so they're, they're, they're way off. They can't just get to Saul quickly and help him and deliver him. But they saw that the men of Israel fled and that Saul and his sons were dead. So their leader goes down. Not just his leader, but anyone that, you know, might have thought, well, one of these guys will be the heir after him. This will be the next leader. They're all dead. You know, their leadership is just taken out, gone, that they're dead. And it says that once they saw that, once they saw that they were all dead, they forsook the cities and fled. They said, we're, we're not even going to fight. We're not even going to put up a fight anymore. We're just here, Philistines, have these cities. They didn't go in there and, you know, hunker down and, and batten down the hatches and, you know, fortify themselves and try to have one last stand or hold off the enemy from, from gaining any more ground. They just completely backed out and just said, you, you can have it all. And what this shows us is the importance of leadership. You know, we should never underestimate leadership in our life. It's very important to have that. And we should never get this attitude of just like, well, I don't need leadership. You know, I don't need anyone to, to guide me or to, 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 you know, help me in any way. I don't need anyone to lead me, right? You know, and this is especially, you know, something that men fall into a little bit more. You know, we as men, because we're, we're naturally independent, we naturally are skeptic, more skeptical, you know, we... Uh, just by nature, want to be the leaders ourselves, and we're you know it's not it's not natural for men to you know submit so much. It's something we kind of have to learn, isn't it? You know, even from just being a little you know little guy, they got to kind of learn you know who's in charge, and they they try to. And of course, all kids kind of go there, but men kind of that's something we have to learn as even as we grow older. You know, as we get bosses, as we get involved in churches, so on and so forth. But we can see from the story how important it is. You know, I mean, it's not, they just saw their leader go down. It's like, that's it. It's all over. They just quit, and they went away because they just knew we don't have any leadership. We're done. They didn't know how to organize themselves. They didn't know what the next move was. And <clears throat> here's the thing about leadership. You know, say, well, what's the big deal about leadership? You know, why, why does it matter? Why does somebody, you know, have to be in charge? Because, you know, order has to be maintained. You have to have order or leadership in order to maintain order. And you can set that, you know, in any setting. You know, I mean, there's so many different settings where this comes, you know, in the house, like in Ephesians 5, in a church, at work. I mean, isn't somebody at, in charge at work where you work? I'd imagine you probably have a superior or a boss. You know, or if, if we work for ourselves, you know, we got to be our own boss. You know, not everybody can go into business for themselves because of the fact that that takes more discipline to be your own boss. You know, sometimes if, you, if you're working for yourself, it's kind of like, well, life's just about taking it easy or something like that. That's a, you're going to go out of business. You're going to be working for somebody else real quick with that kind of an attitude. <clears throat> but we need leadership in all these different areas. Why? In order to maintain order. If you look in Ephesians chapter 5, look at verse 22, it says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. That's not a popular verse today in, in America or the world. Submit unto your own husbands. Oh, you know, you just hair-lipped every liberal between here and everywhere else. As unto the Lord. I mean, that's, that's pretty serious. You know, submit unto your own husband as unto the Lord. How much should we submit unto the Lord? All the way. All the way. How much should we say, you know, I'll submit to the Lord, but not this. Not in this area. I'm going to do whatever I want in this area. Well, then you're not, can you really say you're submitted unto the Lord? And he's saying, look, wives have to submit unto their own husbands in the same way. For the husband is the head of the wife. He's the head. What is he talking about? He's, you know, the, he's the ruler. He's over her in the Lord. He's to, to lead her about. Even as Christ is as the head of the church. So how much should Christ be the head of this church? Just a little bit? Or all of it? All of it. Should we say, yeah, you know, this church, we, we, we believe the Bible. You know, we, you know we, we follow the word of God. We're submitted to the Lord, except for these few things. There's just a few things here that in the Bible that we just don't like. We don't do that here. We just do things different. We do the complete opposite. Then are we really submitted on the Lord? You know, and that same thing rolls, you know, you, and, and Paul's using as an example for the wives saying they have to be submitted even as the church is submitted unto Christ. 
which is all the way, 100%. <clears throat> therefore, as Christ, look at verse 24. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let their wives be to their own husbands in everything. In everything. And you say, well, I don't know about that. But this just goes to show you again the importance of, you know, who you marry is very important. It's like, it's the, you know, I've always heard it said, and I agree with this, you know, it's probably, you could say, the second biggest decision that you'll ever make in your life is the person you marry. The first one is what you're going to do with Christ, right? That's kind of a no-brainer. Are you going to get saved or not, right? Close second, who you marry. Because if you're going to, if you're going to say, well, I'm going to live my, my life by the, the Bible, then that's a pretty heavy, heavy thing to take on. I'm going to submit unto my husband and everything. You better make sure he's a good leader. Better make sure he's got his head on straight and knows what he's doing because you've got to be submitted to that person. And that's not always easy. You know, there's plenty of people out there that wives who, who, who read that and just think, I can't submit to this guy. I mean, he, he doesn't know what he's doing. And they're right. He's a poor leader. So it all comes back to the importance of leadership. You know, we should never, if we're in a position of leadership, we should not take that lightly. Because, we're, because why? Because we're leading other people. I mean, look what happened when Saul died. Everyone's gone. Everyone just scatters. That tells me that Saul's a pretty important guy, that that leadership is important. That role is important. So if we're going to be a leader to somebody, whether it's in the context of work or at church or in a, in a marriage relationship where we're a husband and we're leading a home and we're, our wives are submit to us, we better know what we're doing. And we better be leading them in the right direction. And people say, well, I don't know. I, that just doesn't sound very, very fun, fair. I know. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty unfair to put all that responsibility on the husband, isn't it? <laughs> I read it too, and I go, well, I don't know about that. Man, that sounds like a lot of work. Because it is. Because it's important. Because leadership matters. You know, and you can apply this to, you know, the, the child-parent relationship. You know, that your parents are your leader. And you should submit to them. You know, you should, in the, in, 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 you know that doesn't mean they're going to be perfect. Doesn't mean they're going to always do the right, make the right decision. Everyone makes mistakes. But we should, you know, make sure that we're giving them the, the proper respect, just for even trying to fill that role at all. You know, it's real easy to look at leadership and pick them apart and say, well, they messed that up, or they didn't do that right. Yeah, but, I mean, how good a job would we do at it? It's easy to look at somebody and say, well, you know, they're really lacking in this area as a leadership. They're really lacking. Yeah, because it's hard to do. And nobody does it perfectly, whether in any position, whether it's as a, you know, uh, in the church, at home, at, at work, wherever. So we should always, you know, you should always be willing to give your leaders a little bit of slack. Because they're, they're you know, they're not going to be perfect. They're going to make mistakes. They're not going to always do things right. But they're trying to fill some pretty big shoes whether it's as a husband, as a parent, as a, as a boss, whatever. <clears throat> and you know what the proof of that is? You know what the proof of that is? Is that the fact that leadership just can't be replaced on a moment's notice, generally speaking. I mean, Saul's dead. The sons are dead. You don't see anybody else going, all right, so-and-so, you're up. You're on deck. You're next. We need a leader now. These guys are all gone. Where, where's so-and-so? We all know he's, 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 got, he's got what it takes. Leadership is hard to find. It's hard to find good leadership. It's valuable. And the proof is that is it can't just be replaced on a moment's notice. It leaves a void. That's exactly what happened in the story. The leadership is gone. Everyone just takes off. And the Philistines just walk right in and sit in the chairs and eat the porridge and sleep in the bed and just have, have a field day. And that was the easiest you know, real estate purchase they ever made. Everyone just left, and we just walked right in. No resistance at all. Why? Because everybody was dead? No, because everybody fled. And why did they flee? Because there was no leadership. There was no one there to fill that void. If you would, uh, you know, just stay where you're at. You know, And why is it that leadership can't just be fulfilled on a moment's notice? Because leadership has to be trained. Leadership, you know, leaders have to be made. I, mean, you know, I know some people are just a natural born leader, but even they have to learn the lessons of what it takes to be a leader, right? 
they don't just walk into it saying, I know everything there is to know about leadership. I know what pitfalls to look out for. I know how to handle every single situation. Nobody's like that. The reason why leadership is valuable is because it cannot be replaced on a moment's notice. It can't be replaced on a moment's notice because it takes training to bring up leaders. You know, and again, that all comes back to the importance of it. And if we're, our, if we're leaders, you know, if we're parents, you know, we're training the next, le- the next generation. We're training leaders. You know, husbands, you are, moms and dads, they're training husbands and their sons. They're training somebody's husband. They're training some head of a, of a wife. They're training, you know, maybe they're training a pastor. Maybe they're training, you know, uh, somebody who's going to be a supervisor somewhere someday. You know, they're, you're training leadership as in your children. That's important. That's not something you should just take lightly. You know, you say, well, you know, it goes, same goes for daughters. They're going to raise up children someday. They're going to lead their children. Paul told Timothy, the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. That's how leadership is, is brought on board. That's how leadership comes about. It's not because it's just automatically there. It has to be trained. That's the process that we see with Paul. He said, the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses. He's saying, you know, all the, 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 my faith, my manner of life, my conversation, all the things that you have heard of me among many witnesses. You've got to remember, Paul is taking Timothy all, on all of his journeys. Timothy's there, and he's hearing the preaching among many witnesses. He's seeing how Paul handles this situation. He's seeing how Paul handles that situation. He's with Paul through all these ups and downs in his ministries. <clears throat> And Paul's reminding him of that. He's saying, look, the thing that thou have heard of me among many witnesses. And that tells me this, that if you're going to try and bring up the next leader, you know, you're trying to train up leadership, you know how you do it? By example. By example. Not just by, hey, do this, hey, do that. Hey, this is right, this is wrong. There's a, that's important. But you've got to back all of that up by being the example of leadership. Because actions speak louder than words. And that's what Paul is saying here. He says, the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses. He's talking about the fact, you've known my manner of life. You've seen, you know my doctrine. You've been with me, Timothy. You know what I'm about. You know how I live. He's been an example to Timothy. And that's what may, has made Timothy a leader. The same commit thou to faithful men. Now he's telling now you go do it. Now you go train up other men who shall be able to teach others also. Look, leadership's important because it, it, without it, things fall apart. Someone has to maintain order. Leadership's important because of the fact that it can't be replaced on a moment's notice. It's something that has to be invested in in other people. I mean, you think about the example of Joshua, right? I think he's one of the greatest examples of leadership, of what it takes to make a leader. Did he just start out a leader? No, he started out by being a follower. In fact, the Bible says he was Moses' servant. Far, you know, way before he ever came in to be the guy to lead the tribe of Israel into, into the promised land and bring down Jericho and fight all the Canaanites and, and take over the land. Long before that, he was, he was what? Moses' servant. You can think about Elisha. You know, they, they, Elijah comes, throws his mantle upon him. He goes and starts following Elisha. And then, you know, you really don't hear anything about him other than he gets a little mention that he's the one that poured waters upon Elijah's hand. And that was his job. It's time to wash my hands, Elisha, bring the water. You know, and you kind of wonder what kind of a guy Elijah was. You know, I don't, it doesn't say he was, you know, I don't, I think he was probably a little bit more of a a grumpier guy. Like he wasn't maybe the most charismatic individual or whatever. But he was, he was God's man. And maybe Elisha was kind of, had to pay his dues just pouring water on his hands. But that's what, you know, he saw the example of Elijah. Joshua saw the example of Moses, not just the words. He saw how Moses conducted himself, and that's what made him into a great leader himself. Look, leadership's important because of the fact that it doesn't just come about naturally. It has to be trained in those that are following us. It has to be instilled in others. Going back to our story, we'll wrap it up here in verse 8. It says, and it came to pass on the morrow... When the Philistines came to strip the slain, that they found Saul and his three sons fallen in Mount Gilboa. And they cut off his head and stripped off his armor and strained it into the land of the Philistines round about to publish it in the house of their idols and among the people. 
And they put his armor in the house of Ashtaroth, and they fastened his body to the wall of Bethshan. So if you remember, the whole reason why Saul killed himself is so that they wouldn't abuse him, right? They didn't, he didn't want to be tortured. He, didn't want to, he, he wanted to be spared any further humiliation. Remember what they did to, to uh, uh, we were just talking about him, Samson? When they caught Samson, they put out his eyes, and they made sport with him. They made him to grind in the, in the house. When they brought him out to make sport, they mocked him. That's what the Philistines did. That's, you know, that, that Saul's trying to avoid this being humiliated. But even in his death, he's still humi- humiliated. His head's cut off. He's stripped of all his armor. His body's hung, you know, all in all likelihood, just bare naked on the side of the wall. And he's just, his, he's, his, I mean, his body parts are being spread around the, you know, it's, it's, it's humiliating. I mean, who wants that at their death? You know, and most people just want a nice ceremony and you guys can go eat some food afterwards and talk about how much you're going to miss me, right? Or not miss me. <laughs> That's not what Saul got. He gets beheaded, humiliated, and that was his fear. And this goes back to the point I made at the beginning, that your sin has far-reaching consequences. It has consequences that go beyond what you can anticipate. Now, Saul didn't see all of his sons being slain and his body being desecrated when he decided to disobey the commandments of the Lord, but that's exactly what happened. You know, the other example would be of Abimelech. Remember in Judges, Judges 9, where he, they're trying to, you know, he's rebelling and he's taking over, and they're, they go up against that tower. Remember the story? And, the, and he's trying to take the tower, and, the, and he gets close to the tower, and the woman throws a millstone off the top, and it cracks his skull open. Remember that story? And he says to his servant, uh, the young man, his armor bearer, draw thy sword and slay me, that men say not of me, a woman slew him. He didn't want that to be the way he went out. He wanted an honorable death. He didn't want to say, oh, a woman slew him. Because he's this mighty warrior. He's supposed to be this great guy. Well, how did he die? Oh, some lady threw a millstone on his head and he died. Doesn't sound good, right? Guys want to go out with like, he died. He went out in a blaze of glory. You know what I mean? He went out on a shield, not... A woman threw a rock on his head. That was it. There's no honor in that. You know, we want to we want to fight. We want to die fighting a bear. You know, not having someone throw a rock on our head. <laughs> and it says, and his young man thrust him through, and he died. But is that how is that how he's remembered? Remember what uh, in Second Samuel when David is you know plotting against. Um, um, I can't believe it. I'm forgetting his name. He says in verse 18, Then Joab sent and told David the things concerning the war and charged the messenger, saying, When thou hast made an end of telling the matters of the war unto the king, if so be the king's wrath arise, he say unto thee, Wherefore approached ye so nigh unto the city when ye did fight? Know ye not that they would shoot from the wall? And this is how Abimelech is remem- remembered all those years later when David is, he recalls the story as an example. Or he's saying this is what David might say, Right? who smote Abimelech, the son of Jerubesh, Besheth, did not a woman cast a piece of, of millstone upon him from the wall? So again, this Abimelech, you know, he's, his, he's like, I don't want to go out like this. That's not going to be remembered. So he has his armor bearer thrust him through, but everyone remembers that it was a woman. All these years later, he's saying, look, David might say to you, why did you go so near the city? Don't you remember what happened to Abimelech, how a woman threw a piece of millstone off there and crushed his head? That's exactly what happened. And, you know, here's the point that I'm getting at, okay? Saul, you know, he didn't want, he didn't, he didn't want his body cut up and put on a wall and, and his armor put in some idol's house and his head published throughout all the land. He didn't want that. So he killed himself. He's trying to avoid the consequences of his sin. You know, Abimelech, he didn't want to go out like that. You know, he was a rebel. You know, he, was, he, 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 he didn't want to have it be said of him that, you know, in his death that a woman slew him, but that's exactly how people remembered. And Saul's body was desecrated. What's the point? Is that you cannot foresee the consequences of sin. You know, you can pick your sin, but you cannot pick the consequences of it. You can pick your sin, and you say, I'm going to do this. You know, that's on the table. But you cannot pick the consequences. You can't say, I'm going to sin, and then this is what's going to happen. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know how far that sin's going to reach or what it's going to do. You cannot pick the results of sin. You can only pick sin. 
It says in verse 11, And when the inhabitants of Jabesh-Gilead heard of that which the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men arose and went all night, and they took the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons from the wall of beth Shan, and came to Jabesh and burnt them there. And they took their bones and buried them under a tree at Jabesh and fasted seven days. Now, this is an interesting way that this chapter, this book, closes out. Because everything, you kind of see what happens to Saul, and you got to kind of say, well... Kind of had it coming, you know. He was a bad king at the end, you know. And, and people walk away from the story of Saul, think, and, and he gets a really bad rap, well-deservedly. His, his stigma is warranted. But what we're seeing here at the end is that, you know, God could have just ended it there, you know, how he was just desecrated, and that was it. But God in his word decides to tell us a story about these men of Jabesh Gilead, which is very significant in the story of Saul how they went, and it says they were very valiant, and indeed they were. I mean, nobody else, everybody else has fled, and they go by night, and they gather, you know, Saul's body back, and his sons burn him and bury his bones. They're doing honor, and God decided to, 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 to put this story in at the end of the book, I believe, to remind us of the fact that Saul was not always a bad guy. And that's the tragedy of Saul, is that he's somebody, if we remember when we started this book, who started out very meek, very humble, was very small in his own sight. And it's a tragedy what happened in his life. And it goes to show us that, you know, if we're not careful, power will go to our heads and how it can just corrupt us completely. And say, well, you know, boy, Saul had it coming. Yeah, but how would we handle what he went through if we got put in that position? If just overnight we go from just being the smallest of all the tribes and the smallest house in our tribe to being the king, could we handle that kind of promotion? You know, sometimes God keeps us low because he knows we, we just can't handle it. And so go easy on Saul. I'm not saying he didn't deserve what he got. He got what was coming. But I believe God's throwing this in here at the end to kind of remind us he wasn't always a bad guy and to remind us that it can happen to anybody and that people can go bad, and, but that doesn't mean that they were always bad. <clears throat> go over to, no, I'll just read to you, okay, because I know I've got to wrap up. But it says in Roman, or Proverbs chapter 10, the memory of the just is blessed. The memory of the just is blessed. But the name of the wicked shall rot. You know, people are going to remember you based on whether you were somebody who was, you know, a just person or whether you were uh, a wicked person. You know, people remember what kind of people we were. And it says the memory of the just is blessed. People think about back on just people and they say, man, this guy was a great guy. You know, he did this, he was, you know, you go to these funerals where, you know, some good guy or some, some nice person dies. People have nothing but good things to say. I don't know if I've ever been to a funeral, but it's got to say, yeah, he was rotten. <laughs> he always did me dirty. He's always cheating at this and whatever. You no know, one ever gets up at a funeral, so at least I hope not. But the name of the wicked shall rot. No one's getting, people are going to ask, I'm, you know, let's just forget about that guy. What did he ever do? Yeah, he's just one of those guys. It rots, it decays, it goes away. But the memory of the just is blessed. People like to keep in memory people that are good. And Saul's kind of a mix of both, isn't he? Right? Saul, we look about him, he's like, the memory of Saul is kind of rotten. You think about Saul, the first things that come to mind are just how he, you know, pursued David, how he killed the 70 priests, you know, and just other things that he did. Went to a witch, committed suicide, you know, was disgraced in his death. I mean, it's a lot of bad things, right? But remember, remember the men of Jabesh Gilead at the beginning of the story? <clears throat> you know, to them, Saul was somebody that was just. And because of what he had done for them, remember uh, how they came to him to put out, the, 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 the king came to them, the, the, the enemy came to them and said, unless you come out and give us your city, you know, we're going to destroy you. And they made a covenant, the men of Jabesh Gilead, they said, you know, if you let us thrust out your right eye, we'll spare you. They wanted to bring a reproach upon Israel. And who did the men of Jabesh Gilead call out to? They called out to Saul. And Saul, you know, hacked up his ox and sent it around Israel and said, so shall be done to all the men, the oxen of all the men who do not come with me to deliver the men of Jabesh Gilead. And he goes, there was the first battle he ever fought as a king. And he goes and he delivers the men of Jabesh Gilead. And you know what? And the men of Jabesh Gilead never forgot that about Saul. And when they heard that Saul was dead, they said, you know what? We're not just going to let the, him rot, his, the mem his memory rot. 
You know, he did a lot of bad things, but you know what? He did some good things too. And he delivered us, you know, when nobody was going to help us. <clears throat> so, you know, we should always try, if people go bad or people have done us dirty or whatever, we should always try to remember the good that others have done. Always try to remember, you know, people always tend to focus on the negative. People always tend to focus on people's misgivings or mistakes. You know, we shouldn't be like that. We should try to always see the good. We should always try to remember the good that others have done, especially when they've done it to us. Because that's what I believe the men of Jabesh Gilead did for Saul. They could have just said, yeah, he deserved it. Yeah, and you know what? He did. But they also remember, but there was that when he first started. And he was a pretty good guy. And all those, you know, we were going to lose our right eye, <laughs> all of us. And Saul was the one that rallied the troops and came and delivered us. So let's, you know, even though he deserved it, let's go honor him. Let's go bless his memory. But, you know, ultimately... Saul does serve as a cautionary tale, doesn't he? That even the meekest person among us can be filled with pride and ruin their life. You know, pride leads to a tragic end. You know, pride is a very dangerous thing, and it's one of the hardest things to see in yourself. To, and we can see it in other people real easy. <laughs> we'll hear people say something, we'll see them do something, and go, man, that's just smacks of pride. But it's so hard to see in our own selves. It's so hard for us to recognize our own pride. So well, I'm not being proud. I really am that good. <laughs> I'm not being proud. I am the best. I know it. You know? But pride leads us often to a tragic end. And what we also see in Saul is it's not how you start. It's how you finish. I mean, the men of Jabesh Gilead, they say, oh, he started out so good. Yeah, but he didn't finish very well. It's, it's not how you start. It's how, it's how you finish. You know, and the other way that works is if you started out bad, you can still finish well. That's the positive, right? You can still sow to the Spirit. You know, I've sown to the flesh and I've reaped corruption. Okay, sow to the flesh, or excuse me, sow to the Spirit and reap life everlasting. Because it's how you end, not how you start, that matters. There have been plenty of people that started out real good, like a Saul, and then just went really bad and just ruined everything. And most people aren't going to sit back and go, well, you know, at least he started out good. They're going to say, boy, he really messed everything up, didn't he? But when you have somebody who starts out poorly and ends well, you know, that's admirable. So, you know, Saul's story is a tragic one, but, it, it, you know, it's, it's, it's there in the Scripture. You know, I'm not, you know, Saul's up in heaven. This is all being preached, you know, all these thousands of years, a sermon after sermon after sermon about him. But you know what? I'm glad he's in there. I'm, I'm glad he's in there. You know, when you get to heaven and you meet him, you might want to just thank him. Like, thanks for, you know, for being that example in Scripture. Not, not the best example. You know, thank the Lord that he put, it, that put Saul in there. You know, that, that we can look to somebody like Saul and say, hey, he starts out meek. But even the meekest person can just get filled with pride. They can make a mess of things. And it's not how you start. It's how you finish in life. Let's go ahead and pray.